Well, friends, I would invite you to uh, join your hearts with mine as we pray this morning. Lord, take these lips and speak through them. Take these thoughts and think through them. And yes, Lord, take this heart and set it on fire. Amen. Oh, it's so good to be with you this morning. So good to be here in this place. It, it has been a while uh, since we've been together this way. I, think, I don't think I have been back to preach on a Sunday morning uh, since I left with the family back in 2010. So uh, forgive me if I'm a bit rusty. Uh, um, it, uh, being a pastor... It's very challenging work. The work I've done over the last 12, 13 years has been challenging, but there's nothing like this work. So I hope that when Pastor Allison is back, you will uh, give her a big hug or whatever you do to show your appreciation, because this is where the life of the church is lived out. Well, friends, today is Christ the King Sunday. Uh, we've had that announced already. It's a very special Sunday. It's observed by Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Episcopalians and Roman Catholics. And it marks the end of one church year. We could call this uh, New Year's Eve if we wanted to. Next Sunday, ready or not, is the first Sunday in Advent. Oh, my gosh. Many of us are already in the Christmas mode. We're thinking about gifts and parties and, and wrapping and cards and all of that. But today, the church invites us to slow down, to pause, and to hold steady for a moment, not to rush forward. There's a crucial message that we are to hear this morning. And I'm really grateful that I get to be one of those who shares it with you this morning. It has been a long time since I have filled this pulpit, had this privilege. As I said, almost 20 years ago, I started here, and that doesn't seem possible. Many of you who are here in this space and online weren't here when I was around, so I'm glad to make your acquaintance. And I know that there were some who were here then who have gone on to glory, and I give thanks to them uh, for them. And then those of us who uh, were here then and here now, it's good to reconnect and uh, to see your faces again. I have some great memories from those days. Um, I remember Sunday night Bible studies at Bob and Jackie Baker's. I see Joe out there. Um, those are always fun. Confirmation retreats at Casawasco. We had some great times there. Children's times with Leopold. Christmas Eve, candlelight services, this place just seemed magical on Christmas Eve to me. And of course, rummage sales, and rummage sales, and rummage sales. I still have a pair of boots that I bought at one of those, and they're still quite good, so I'm grateful for those. But you know, I don't remember many particulars about sermons that I preached um, so when I knew that I would be standing before you today and it would be Christ the King Sunday, I went back and I looked through those sermons from those days. Not to re-preach one. Don't worry, this won't be a rerun. Not that you'd remember it anyway. I could get away with it. But, <laughs> but I really wanted to see what I said, and I was really hoping that I made at least one point and made it well. I would say the most crucial point to make on Christ the King Sunday or really on any given Sunday. And I'll tell you more about that uh, in a few minutes. But first, let's take a, a moment and go a little bit deeper into the scripture passage that, we, uh, uh, that Sharon shared with us this morning. It begins this way. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Now, if you were puzzled when you heard this passage read, wondering why are we, why are we hearing a Good Friday gospel lesson on, you know, a Sunday that's just a few days away from Thanksgiving, 
I understand that. It is a strange selection, but it's what churches all over the world are hearing today on Christ the King Sunday, this story of a man who was beaten, mocked, cross-nailed, dying by the minute, who is called king. Of course, those who call him king are mocking him in this story. If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. Boy, those are cruel things to say to a man who is dying. But given what they believed about kings, we can understand Kings didn't get into this kind of trouble and wind up nailed to a cross on the outside of a city near a garbage dump. Or at least not the kind of king any of them wanted to follow. Those watching that awful day that we call Good Friday, that we remember on Christ the King Sunday, uh, may not have understood all that was going on, but one thing they did understand, this man on the cross was not the kind of king they wanted. What kind of king do you want? What kind of king do I want? That's a question that confronts us every Sunday and perhaps every day in between. You know, there aren't many kings and queens around today for us to look at. The United Kingdom has a new king, Charles III. He's well known, but he's more famous, right? He can't make any laws. He can't send armies into battle. Uh, he can't uh, um, sign any peace treaties. He'll spend most of his days um, christening ships and reading prepared speeches and, you know, doing photo ops in different places. I suppose if we were looking for kings and queens today, we'd look elsewhere, maybe President Xi of China or um, President Biden of our country, or maybe we'd look to different places like uh, Jamie Dimon of uh, J.P. Morgan, or Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank. But if we looked there, uh, we wouldn't see anyone that looks like Jesus. This man we claim as our Lord. And Lord is another way to claim him as king. This king is so different from every sort of ruler that has ever ruled on the face of the earth. This one we claim as our king. His way of being king contradicts everything we know the world says about power and authority and impact. He is the Son of God incarnate, who, as Paul said, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross. He's the kind of king whose birth was announced by angels, but who wound up being born in a barn and had hay for a cradle. He's the kind of king that had little time for the rich and the famous, but made time to teach a woman named Mary and heal a beggar named Bartimaeus and spend uh, a meal time with a crooked tax collector named Zacchaeus. He's the kind of king who doesn't inflict pain, but absorbs it, who doesn't meet out punishment, but accepts it on our behalf. He forgives his killers and welcomes a criminal into his kingdom. He's the kind of king who, after defeating death and busting out of the grave, finds the band of disciples who betrayed him and forgot him and denied him and says to them, 
My peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. And of course, he's the kind of king who says, if you really love him, you will keep his commandments, all of them. He's the kind of king who demands his followers love their enemies, give away their possessions, deal with their own sin before condemning it in others, lay down their swords and pick up their crosses. He's the kind of king who will ask you to refrain from lusting and judging and hating. He's the kind of king who expects his followers to feed the hungry and thirsty, welcome the stranger, give a shirt away to clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned and sick. He's the kind of king who will ask you to repent and believe and follow, even if it means behind leaving wealth, family loyalties, personal security. This is the kind of king that Jesus is. Right? And here's the question. You knew it was coming. Is he the kind of king we want? Is he our kind of king? And if we say yes, and friends, we are here, we've said yes, some of us have said it very loudly, some of us very faintly, but we've said, yes, he's our Lord, he's our king. What does that mean? Are we willing to commit or recommit to following that king? wherever that following takes us. A few years ago, I had a renewal leave. You're in the ministry for a while. Keep this in mind. If, if Pastor Allison hasn't had a renewal leave, you gave me one while I was here. Make sure she takes one. Put that in. She'll thank me for that, I'm sure. <laughs> I had one, 2018. And um, I like... I can sit and be quiet. I'm an introvert. I can do that. But I also like to pray while I'm working. And Dory really likes that because she says, it's a twofer. You get closer to God and we get some stuff done around here. It's really good. <laughs> so on our property, the lower part, um, I don't know what happened. It's been this way since we bought it, but it was gone. It went wild. I was afraid to go down there because something might eat me. It really needed work. <laughs> And so my project, and I took this on gladly, was to go down there with my chainsaw. Yeah, Pastor Bill has a chainsaw, and he loves it. <laughs> and um, everything else I needed to clear that out. This space was going to be reclaimed. True story. Down there I'm praying, and I'm cutting, and I'm clearing, and I'm making this habitable and usable again. And while I'm doing that, I'm I'm, I'm asking Jesus, you know, I know there are areas of my life that need to be claimed by you. What are they? What's that going to be about? I was sort of serious about it, but not very serious about it. But as I was pulling out all that stuff, I sensed the Spirit tell me, yeah, you're right, Bill. There are parts of your life over which I am not your Lord, and you need to give those to me so that I can reclaim them just like you are reclaiming this space. Wow. Wow. Every time I drive into my house, I see that spot, and I'm reminded. I think God intended it that way. C.S. Lewis said that, you know, when we invite Jesus into our lives, it's like when we invite guests into our house, we show our guests, you know, the living room that we had a chance to vacuum and pick up. We show them the kitchen that's been remodeled. We don't take them back into the bedroom or the closet or the basement. Jesus is the kind of king that wants access to every room in our spiritual house and will not be satisfied until he has been let in. And here's the thing. If you come to my office today in uh, Liverpool, which I hope you will someday, you'll see I have a picture on my wall of um, Jesus knocking at the door. I saw this when I was in England 
uh, on sabbatical from this church. It hangs in St. Paul's. Jesus knocking on the door. He wants to come in. But if you look at the door in this painting, you'll see that it lacks one really important thing. It has hinges, it has planks, it has no door handle. The only way Jesus gets in is if someone on the inside opens the door. The king wants in, but he will not force his way in. I'm going to be 58 in January. It's not old. It used to seem old. But I... It's, what's that? Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> but whatever age I am and whatever age you are, there are still rooms in your house that need to be opened up to Jesus. Amen? Any of us done yet? No. So as I was paging through those old sermons, I wanted to see if I said that back then. I sort of did. I want to say it more loudly today. Back then, there was a line I used. I said that Jesus needs to be the determining influence in your life. I think that's a pretty good phrase. But I want to name it a little louder and more emphatic today. Jesus is knocking on the door of some room in your life that you haven't quite let him in yet. Open the door. Here's the good news. He's not coming in with a wrecking ball. He's coming in with spackle and paint and new carpeting, maybe supports for the roof that was sinking in. He's coming in to make that part of your life beautiful. You know, when I got all that brush and crazy stuff out of that lower part of my yard, wildflowers started popping up. Imagine what Jesus and you can grow together and those parts of your life you haven't yet given over. And here's the thing. We start to get our lives more in order. It spills out. We want to change the world. Guess where we got to start? We got to start here, and then it bursts out well beyond the confines of our own life. So that's the word for Christ the King Sunday. What kind of king do we have? Well, what kind of king are you willing to follow? Well, claim your place in his kingdom and open the doors of your life and let new life pour in. Amen.